been here all my life um, down south. I grew up in Palm Beach County where I lived and survived as a kid on carambola and mangoes that I stole from people's trees. And uh, so I've always had a passion for, for tropical fruits. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's just a, a wonderful thing to be able to grow these things here in our own yards and to uh, enjoy them. Uh, just by show of hands, how many people here are uh, native Floridians? We've got a couple of them. Okay, we're outnumbered, guys. <laughs> uh, anybody, anybody here that's just recently moved to Florida within the last year? Wonderful. Good to have you guys. Welcome. It's, uh, Florida's a, a very unique place. There's a lot of fun fictional books based around Florida and all of its uh, eccentricities. But um, uh, I want to talk to you about for, uh, tropical fruit today, obviously. Um, but, uh, but more so, um, I, I think the way I run these seminars is that I'm going to hit on three, this morning I'm going to hit on three of the most common tropical fruits that people grow here. And then I'm going to hit on three very uncommon fruits that you can grow here. But all along the way, as we touch on things, um, feel free to ask questions if it pertains to the specific fruit I'm talking about. Okay, and of course, at the end, I will um, remain here and uh, for as long as need be. I've been here till one o'clock sometimes just talking. If you have individual specific questions like what's this on my lychee tree and why is this doing that? Uh, but I'll try to hit on everything, you know, as, as I go. Um, and then any other tropical fruit questions uh, I might kind of throw in just the general basics of pruning and those types of things. So um, I'd like to start with a big one, mangoes. Okay, everybody loves mangoes. Now we are in a, tri we are right at the beginning of the tropics. We're really kind of subtropical. Unless you're on the beach side, uh, we're pretty much a subtropical zone. So it's kind of that 9B, 10A area where if we get a freeze, you know, we, your trees might be uh, in danger. And there's, I do, I do a whole nother lecture on, uh, on, on saving your trees during the you know, cold protection and things. But um, you know, all the trees that I'm gonna talk about today for the most part, if we get a hard freeze, something that's below 32 degrees for more than 10 hours, there could be some issues. But most trees, if they're large enough, will be fine. And there's ways to save them. And I could talk about that individually, but probably not now because we're coming into the summertime. We don't need to worry about that. We just want to get them in the ground. And so, um, but mangoes. Mangoes, uh, we all, I mean, I grew up on mangoes. Most of the time when you get a mango in the store, it's a bad representation of what a mango is. Mangoes, typically, honestly, right? Am I right? Mangoes, they're stringy. They, they don't ripen properly. Sometimes the seed gets ripe first and then it gets jellied on the inside. And those are because some of the best mangoes to ship are not the best mangoes to eat. Oftentimes you'll find what's called a Tommy Atkins mango, which is a Florida standard, a little bit stringy, but they, they can pick them and they handle, they can take a rough handling well. And that's why you see them in the stores. It's like 4959 or something like that on the code. And then we have the little Altufo mangoes, the little champagne, whatever you want to call them. And they're okay, but they, they're hit and miss. But man, some of the mangoes that you can grow in your own yard that you can just take and cut with a butter knife, no fiber, they have overtones of coconut and pineapple and cinnamon and peach. Those are the kind of mangoes that are available today. Um, there's a guy named Gary Zill. And if anybody has seen the old Florida fruit books by Lewis Maxwell back in the 50s and 60s, his family is, was, was uh, they kind of create a lot of new varieties. And uh, in fact, recently, uh, what's interesting is they took, because you'll see some new varieties coming out of mangoes, because it used to be the typical Hayden and Glenn and Kent and Edward and all those varieties, which are fantastic mangoes, very reliable. But now you see weird ones like pineapple sorbet or coconut cream or spirit of 76 and trying to wonder what these things are. Uh, but what Gary did, just to give you a little briefing on how people create mango cultivars, is they plan out, uh, Gary, Gary Zill planted out about 10,000 seedlings or so, 10,000 seedlings. And from that, he has enough knowledge that he could go around and smell the leaves and know if these seedlings, because typically mango seedlings will revert back to their turpentine mango, which is the original, hard to eat, stringy, tastes kind of piney, uh, but some... So he could tell, smell the leaves themselves and tell whether they've reverted back to uh, turpentine mangoes. And the ones that didn't, he let grow. And that was probably maybe 11 or 1200 mango seedlings. They grew out and then 
per, and from those that cr he, he kept good records of what he crossed to get that and from those are all these new varieties that are coming out so we're kind of in this this, this mango boom right now of fantastic varieties there's some like uh, lemon meringue and lemon zest and orange sherbet that literally taste like sun-kissed soda like an orange soda they're amazing so you'll get your standard mango flavors you know some of the the, the standard ones are great, but some of the new ones coming out are kind of exciting, and it's neat to see new varieties come out. So when you go to the store, what's that? Are they as hardy? The, they're all about the same hardiness. It's a good question. She asked if they're all the same, if they're all as hardy. Yeah, about 32 degrees, and you're on a small tree, you want to cover it. You know, they'll start to get leaf burn. Anything lower than that for a longer period of time, you've really got to protect, you know. But for the most part, it's worth protecting a tree for what, a couple days in our winters for, you know, 10, 12, 15 years of great mango production, you know, so, and it's just when they're young is when you need to protect them. But yeah, they're all about the same hardiness. I've not seen anything that's changed the hardiness of mangoes. So I say all that to say, there's some fantastic varieties and you may go out to the store and go, I have no idea, you know, what's over here. I, I've never heard of a, a, a carry mango. What is that? You know, but sometimes uh, there's excellent documentation now uh, both in form of book. In fact, if you want to, I think on the on the handout I, I passed out, there's a book by Charles Boning or Boning. He uh, has a fantastic book on, a book on tropical fruit trees. He lists several varieties in there, but in addition to that, he lists like salt tolerances of all the trees and those types of things. So there's some, but in, in addition to the books on the internet, I and mean, we have the internet now, it's fantastic. There's actually on Facebook, there's tropical fruit growing forums you know and tropical fruit and you get a lot of questions answered through that and uh, there's so much information out there now if you choose to plant a mango tree some of the most reliable trees one thing you have to look at there's three kind of main things you want to look at when you're looking at a mango tree number one how big does it get right because some mango trees get this big and those aren't appropriate for most yards right so how big does it get uh, how resistant is it to anthracnose or mildew or rot uh, with the spots you get on there and number number three how good is it is it just a great mango or is it okay mango uh, what is most pleasing to everyone so those three things you look at so what I suggest and I think I have them written down in there is that well let me add one more thing to it if you have room for more than one tree you want to be able to have mangoes all through the summer because there's some varieties that'll give you fruit in May and there's some varieties of fruit that you, of mango that you can actually have on a Thanksgiving table, okay? So um, what I would suggest, my, personally, if someone were to ask me, because I've not, seen the, I've not seen the longevity of some of the newer cultivars, like the ones that Gary Zill's putting out, I don't really know how big they get. I don't know what their resistance is. I don't know what the out years, how, you know, what, but, I, and they're good, but, I, but the reliable ones, I most common refer to people, uh, to a Glen mango. A Glen mango, is a, it's a quintessential mango flavor. A lot of the new guys that are on the forums on the internets are like, ah, oh, those are passe, they're old school, but they're reliable. And everybody loves a Glen mango. And they're consistent producers. Uh, and they, the tree is manageable. You can keep it within 15 or 20 feet. Um, so that's a great one. A lot of the mango varieties that I have in my yard, I have, I think I have 17 varieties and I'm only on a half an acre. But I, I, I planted densely together, but I've got a carry, which stays relatively small. Carry is a great mango, has a little spice to it. Um, uh, I have a cog shawl, which originated in the 1940s in Pine Island on the west coast of Florida. It's a great mango, and I've had it in the ground for probably 15 years, and it's no bigger than 10, 12 feet on its own. So uh, there are many varieties of mango that are called condo mangoes. They stay smaller. And so it's easier to place in the yards and you can get a couple varieties in. So to answer the question, what kind of, what should I put in? I would say a Glen would be my number one. Um, uh, another great one, if you like uh, Southeast Asian mangoes, or, is called a Nam Dok Mai, N-A-M Doc and then Mai, M-A-I. And that's a really good one. It's got a very a strong a kind of peach overtone. Um, it stays to a nice compact tree. So. But there's so many varieties out now, you really have to determine what you want for your yard. Do I have a lot of room? Do I have a little bit of room? Do I want a couple of mangoes that are gonna give me fruit all summer? Um, but for the most part, they're all gonna have a wonderful mango flavor 
cut like butter these days and uh, some will just have some neat overtones. The one that blooms later in the year is called a kit. K-E-I-T-T, -K -E kit mango. K-E-I-T-T. -T. And they're, they're pretty, pretty large mangoes and I've had them as late as October, probably down south, probably as late as November. So, but there's a lot of varieties like in the early ones, um, uh, Pickering, P-I-C-K-E-R-I-N-G, is a fantastic mango that is a really early mango. Um, that's a great one. She, what she asked was, how can you identify a mango if you move to a, a house and you're not sure? Sometimes the long, skinny leaves will give it away. Some, some of the more Southeast Asian mangoes have longer leaves, um, but it's really hard to identify them uh, you know, you know, from one to the other. So let me get back. What was the question about? Someone just had a question. I didn't get to it. Yeah, how long before? Right, right. That's, uh, let me answer this question. How long before it fruits? No one's going to want to hear this. But when you plant a mango tree, say I plant this tree right here. This is a, uh, that's a Kent tree, probably a couple years old after graft. The, what happens when you have a, 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 these are all grafted mango trees, right? So does everybody know what a grafted mango, graft is? You basically have a root stock, just like, the, like citrus, and then you graft in what's called a scion. It's, it's, the, it's a piece of an adult tree the tip of an adult tree. You put those two together and then they start growing. But the problem is, is that the top of the tree thinks it's mature and wants to bear fruit, but the bottom of it can't support the fruit, right? So you have, yeah, everybody's like, oh, my mango tree's blooming and it's got all these fruit on it and it's this big. And it, what, that, what's that, what that's gonna do is it's gonna, it's gonna cause the tree to set back. You wanna, the first couple years, literally, when they start to fruit, if they don't drop on their own, I pick them off on my own. Because think about the energy it takes to produce a large mango like this. All the nutrients and all the water, and, all, it just, it, and what we're doing is taking away energy from that, that tree, which is really a young tree, becoming established into the ground. So as much as it's hard to bear, that's why some people will buy them a little bit bigger, buy like a, you know, a seven gallon, it has a better chance, but nonetheless, you really wanna get that thing set up. So to answer the question, when will it start fruiting? It'll probably want to fruit right away, but I wouldn't let it fruit right away, okay? You want to give it a couple years. If you want it, if you're dying to have something, get it a little bit bigger, let one or two fruit fruit, and then let it come, but you got to let that thing establish itself into the ground. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, okay, mm -hmm. what's that? Yeah, good question about seedlings. Everybody loves to grow mango seedlings. Um, kind of a longer discussion, but there's two kinds of seeds monoembryonic and polyembryonic, okay? The polyembryonic has a better chance, um, probably like a 90% chance of becoming true to, true to the mother plant. Whereas monoembryonics, for the most part, will revert back to the turpentine seedling, which is gross, it's, it tastes, doesn't taste good. So, um, but if you do happen, like I have a bunch of Namdok Mai, which is polyembryonic seedlings growing. And, um, but the only problem with that is it's gonna take about you know, 10 to 15 years for that to finally start producing. Because seedling, just like everybody loves to grow avocado, we'll get to that in a second, but the same thing. You can grow an avocado tree, but it's probably gonna take about 15 years uh, for the thing to actually fruit. That makes sense? So, okay. Oh, she asked about allergies. A lot of people are like, just like Brazilian pepper, uh, are allergic to the sap. Um, but I, I've heard that people that are, if someone can peel it for them, they actually can eat the fruit. But as far as being any different with the response to the sap from it, uh, they're all about the same from what I've experienced. Okay, that's a great question. A lot of times when people grow trees, they're like, it, it, it always says it needs friable, well-drained soil. What does that mean? That means that it just doesn't want to be sitting in water the whole time. But if you think about it, some of the, uh, the, the mango varieties are from India where there's monsoon, Africa, Israel. Mangoes are from all, Southeast Asia, they're from all over the world. And in my experience, and I've been growing mangoes here in Indian River County for close to 20 years, uh, that they could take wet feet. Now it shouldn't be constant, like in a dit in the bottom of a ditch, but but they take wet feet better than most other, as opposed to a, an avocado, which cannot take wet feet. But I'll talk about that later. Um, so to answer the question, yeah, they could take a little bit of of, of water. Too much water um, might you know, uh, make, give it a sooty mold problem with sprinklers hitting it all the time, but it can take some wet feet, yes. She asked about, well, when can you leave it, let it fruit? 
and I would say probably, um, I would say give it at least two years in the ground, two years in the ground, and then perhaps if it holds fruit on its own, then that you can probably let it hold a couple fruit, you know. But uh, but too too much overbearing uh, when it's young will set your tree back and it will not grow properly. It won't anchor in. You know what I mean? So. Well, are they fuzzy-tailed rats that live in trees? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take it. Hold on, I'll, I'll show. Yeah, I'm gonna take a tree rats. Yeah, we're gonna take a diversion real quick. Just if you will, I want to talk about pests uh, before I get to the next tropical fruit because um, we put these trees in and we baby them and we take care of them, we mulch them and we do all the stuff, and then I look out in my yard and there's I catch I catch them, I catch squirrels. And they're just looking at me and they're nibbling on a completely unripe mango that's completely ruined. Avocado. I've had squirrels strip a lychee tree, gone in one night, you know. And so what do you do about this, the, the animals? Well, here's what I try to do. Well, I'm not going to tell you what I really do, but um, <laughs> I, no, I, I can't. I can't. No, so, what's, oh, yeah. <laughs> what's, what someone said is that uh, it was a wise saying, some Hawaiian guy said, plant uh, enough for your family, plant enough for your friends, and plant enough for the animals, you know? And so um, a couple of the things that you could do to, to mitigate that problem is have, have uh, distraction things. I don't know, maybe, maybe a, a, away from the side yard, a bunch of peanuts all the time for the squirrels to go to, or maybe you have uh, some mulberry trees, or you have uh, other types of trees that kind of produce things, but you, we, we will, you're going to lose fruit to rats and to squirrels. You just will. There's no question about it. I, and birds. Yeah, I've done some creative things. I've taken hardware cloth. It's kind of like that, that, that narrow chicken wire. And this is last year. I'm like, they're not getting my lychees this year. And so I took and I, I just made sort of these, these cones. These, these, I just took some sections and made like a, like a cylinder and pinched off the bottom and then just slid it up the, the clump of lychees and then, or mango, and then pinched it off and then zip tied it to the stem. And it worked, it stayed, they didn't get to it, which is fine, but it's a lot of work, but it depends on how many trees you have. Also, taking a, a, a two liter Coke bottle and simply slicing it from the, slice it, putting a slit in it from the, I, I usually cut the bottom of it out, put a slit in it from the top down on one side, and then you could take it and open it up and just put it around a mango because and because the stem the stem comes down and and that's prevented squirrels because they come down they they try to scratch at it to see if it's ripe and that alone has done the trick you know so there's a lot of ways that you can kind of mitigate that that aren't uh, too harmful but it's 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 an ongoing problem you know you, you get rid of some squirrels and then a million come back so uh, but you asked about rats um, there's two kinds of rats and that that I typically see here there's the little small it's called a hispid or a cotton rat. It's a native rat. And then you have the larger Nor the Norway rats. Either, most of the hispid rats, the small native ones, don't do much damage. But sometimes the other rats can. They, they'll eat out citrus and stuff, you know. And you just have to try to protect your trees the best you can. And know that you're going to have to lose them. And once you know that, it makes the battle a little less difficult, you know. So, you know, yeah. Yeah, so I've, I've heard that before. I tried that. Um, uh, what is that called? Uh, What's the, the bride's veil, uh, tool, tool, no, tool, tool, yeah. tool netting. And I've done that. I did that on a couple things because people said that the squirrels don't like to get that in their nails. And it, and it worked on a few trees, a couple of other tree, things like they just tore it all up. So it just, it depends. But there are a lot of things you can do. I've not found any sprays that really work well. You know, if you, she asked, uh, what, what, about, what about when you have a lot of fruit on one branch? What will happen is, the tree knows how big to make those fruit. Just like a peach tree, if you have a bunch of peaches uh, close together, they'll all be a little smaller, right? And if you want bigger ones, you take a few out, same thing. If you want larger mangoes, you would simply take a couple of those off of there, okay. especially if it's young. But if you wanna have several mangoes that are smaller, it'll be fine. The tree, depending on the age of the tree, it kinda of knows what to do. So any other mango questions? Yes? Good question. Uh, how about you real quick? I'm gonna come back to that. Yeah, so what I said before, a um, couple of things. We'll talk about feeding real quick, and I'm gonna, it's a kind of a broad general question on feeding, and we'll also talk about diseases. One of the most common things with mangoes is um, the anthracnose or like a, a black rot, and some get it, some don't. It depends on if we're in a dry season when, the, when they're fruiting or not. Um, 
There are some varieties that are far more uh, susceptible to it, and then there's some that are not. Typically the ones I think that I've written in the paper, and you could do a little research, um, are a little more resistant to it. But it just depends on how much weather and how much humidity and how much rain we have, rainfall. Because a lot of rainfall will produce a lot of, a lot of that. Um, but some, some varieties are more resistant, resistant than others. So, um, you know. So as far as feeding go, let me talk about feeding real quick. When I put down uh, my mango trees, um, I'm kind of a lazy gardener, so to speak. I don't really do much fertilizing. In the early years, if I put a tree in the ground and I don't see that it's really kicking as quickly as I'd, I, I'd like it to, you can put down just a general 666, uh, organic or not either way. Uh, or some people put compost down, uh, definitely mulch, and I can talk about that towards the end. But as far as feeding them goes, once they get into production, I've had people use, a, um, I've used a citrus tone, which is just a general tropical fruit um, fertilizer, which seems to work really well. But uh, it's, yeah, it's called citrus tone. Okay. It's uh, citrus and avocado. It seems to work fine for mangoes. But in my yard, I've got, you know, all my trees, I really don't do, I don't do any pesticides. I don't really do any fertilizers. Mangoes, some of the tropical fruit trees are great because, uh, uh, with citrus, you've really got to feed them heavily and you got to take care of it. Like, what's this on my leaf and why is this doing this? You got greeting, but citrus trees tend to be pretty, a little more hardy, I think, when it comes to uh, not needing to be pampered. Um, so, but if you want to get a tree to grow quickly, obviously high nitrogen is going to put it in the right spot. Uh, but to get it to, to fruit, sometimes uh, the best thing is just a good dry spell, you know, because fruit want to produce when they're under stress. And so, I've not really found that I needed to do any fertilizing with some of my trees, unless I'm really trying to get them established. So, okay. Yeah, good question. She asked, she's got some large trees that she wants to bring back. And everybody's going to deal with this at some point if you have mango trees. Like I have a glen right now that's pushing 25, 30 feet, and I need to pull it down after it fruits. So after your tree fruits, I would say bring the canopy down to no more than 20%. You, you don't want to take away more than 20% at one time. So if that makes sense, if you can picture what 20% would be on a canopy of tree. And also, uh, I learned from Richard Campbell, he's from down in, uh, I think he's at Fairchild down south. You wanna take out some of this, the, the larger central pushing uh, uh, limbs, because that takes some of the vigor out of the tree. And so you don't wanna, and what, so what I do after the fruit, I'll, let me touch on the pruning a little bit. If you do have large trees, the time to prune is after they've fruited, okay? So probably gonna be around July or August after they're done fruiting. If you're not here, then yeah, call somebody to have it done, <laughs> honestly. Try to find someone reliable. Well, you might not get fruit, that's all. I, don't care. I'm not here when it's I would definitely get it done early, yeah, yeah. D get it done early, yeah, get it done when you can then, yeah. Because you wanna bring that, fruit, listen guys, fruit trees wanna be manageable. If you have trees that are put, if you have mangoes that are up there, Who's going to get them? You know, the squirrels and the birds and everything else, and they might fall on your head, but that's it. So, guys, every single tree I talk about today, you want to keep it, and you can keep it at 12 to 15 feet. You can manage that. It's not a problem. Just keep it down. So, after it's done fruiting, you want to tip your mangoes, which means you simply you can cut back dip to the nodes, say, take two or three feet off of them. If it's really congested, you take out one of the big central leaders in the center, open the tree up a little bit, especially coming into hurricane season. Um, so that's kind of the way to do it and when to do it. And I can, I can talk to people individually if you have specific examples about how and when to prune those things. So, well, let me jump to the next one real quick, avocado. Um, avocados, unlike mangoes that can take wet feet, avocados, if you have any avocados, you wanna make them high and dry high and dry. There's, they're hard. Sometimes they're tough to grow. I lost a couple of avocados. Uh, there's a tree called a red bay, which is the same family. And a couple years back, we lost all the red bays all the way up to like Daytona. You used to see dead trees all along the highway. But the same weevil that came in and got those got people's avocados. And then they bring a fungus in and the whole tree dies. So avocados are a little tough. But there are some really good varieties. I think I have them listed in my document there. I think there are some that can take cold. When you're looking for avocado varieties here in Indian River County, make sure they can take cold. You probably can't do a Simmons. You might not be able to do a day, but there's a Choquette, a Monroe, um, a Winter Mexican, fine one. Number one choice is to find one that actually takes cold. 
some that can go down into the 20s, sometimes 22 degrees. Because if it doesn't, you're gonna get this beautiful tree. We get one, one cold snap and you're done. You have to dig it out. So, so here's the varieties of avocado I'd recommend. I'd recommend Lula, L-U-L-A, Lula, Lula, Monroe, just like Monroe County, Monroe, um, Choquette, C-H-O-Q-U-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. Yeah, Choquette, C-H-O-Q-U-E-T-T-E, -T -T -E. Choquette. And if you just type it in, you'll find it on Google or something. Um, I think Winter Mexican does really well here. And I know there's a couple, yeah, good. Two of them, have they produced yet? Almost, get, good. Winter Mexican, that's, that's my next one to put in. So, um, and then there's another one called a Brogdon, B-R-O-G-D-O-N. It produces a, an avocado that looks like an eggplant. It's purple, literally. And the interesting thing about the, the Brogdon is that it's, it can take cold. It has both the A and the B flowers, so it's self-pollinating. Because avocados, are, Brogdon, Brogdon, yeah. They've got Brogdons here? Oh, wow. I'm gonna go, I'll be right back. <laughs> uh, so, so, so avocados, they have A flowering, flowers that are A flowers and different varieties that are B flowers. It will produce on its own. You don't need two together because typically with, if there's another tree within a mile or two, bees and things will pollinate that. So I wouldn't stress out about, is it an A or a B, do I need both? But it happens to be that the Brogdon does have both the A and the B flowers. And it's a pretty good tasty avocado. Um, number one, they, they really need to be high and dry. They're very prone to, to root rot. And uh, so they've gotta be somewhere where it's well draining, not being constantly hit by sprinklers. Uh, that's very important. But there's some great varieties. There are also varieties that, that can give you fruit longer if you wanna put a couple trees in. Um, that some bloom at one time and then some bloom a little later. Um, but avocados are great. The only thing that I've ever had trouble with is uh, when I see people talk about them is that it, it's too wet of an environment. Um, but pretty much they kind of just go on their own. Seedlings will take about 15 to 20 years to produce fruit, and they'll typically be a really col columnar tie up this way. Um, grafted ones are a little more open, and, and uh, but there's really not much else to say. There's some good varieties. Just make sure, number one, it's cold tolerant, and number two, that you keep it high and dry. Yes? How do you know when to pick the, the avocado? Uh, yeah, how do you know when to pick the avocado? I don't know. I just <laughs> No, yeah, really? Yeah, I, I, think, I think through... According to the internet, it said they, they, after you pick them is when they ripen. Well, they do, right. So when, when do you pick an avocado? When do you pick a mango? Well, typically uh, with a mango, let me just tell you about a mango real quick. To, to know when a mango is ready, you take it, well, there's many signs, but typically the stem coming down will, will actually start to brown up a little bit. It'll get brown. And then if you take the mango and you just hold it on a 90 degree angle, if it comes off on its own gently, then you know it's ready. Now. Sometimes if you have a lot of mangoes, you just kind of have to experiment with it. If you, if you pop it off there and it starts squirting everywhere it, with sap, it's not ready, obviously. But if you pop it off and, and a little bit of sap comes out, that's okay. But typically on a mango, you want to see it get some shoulders to it. What I mean by that is right where it meets the stem, it needs to be a little more meaty at the top. Because instead of just like, and you'll see it, you'll see it develop shoulders, they're called. And so the shoulders will indicate whether that's ready. As far as avocados go, um, I just know that they seem to get a certain shape and you almost have to know what they're going to look like through experience with your own tree and then pick it. It will ripen on the counter. You pick it too early, it won't. But for the most part, it's almost a, a guessing game, really. There's, I mean, some, some mangoes have indicators, but uh, avocados are a little more tricky because there's so many different kinds. Avocado? Yeah. That's a great question. All the tropical fruits I talk about today, salt tolerance is a critical issue. Because not if you're sometimes there's salt spray, sometimes people have it in their wells, depending on how deep your wells are. It, it varies on it varies on every single tropical fruit what's salt tolerant, what's not. But the book I have written in there by Charles Boning, he he goes through every fruit and talks about its salt tolerance in, uh, in that, throughout the whole book. So I can't answer that off off offhand. I know I've seen avocado trees beachside. So I just think it really more depends on the well water that you have or whatever you're being irrigated with. So, but that book would definitely have the answer to it. So, yeah. Do you find your experience matches the recommendations off of Edis? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Another great website is Edis, E-D-I-S. I think I have it listed on the very back page. Um, they, they have all the tropical fruits and it's from the University of Florida. 
extension office and they, they talk about all the fruit trees and they have all the some great advice on there so that's it thank you for that that's a really good recommendation site on that so uh, any other avocado questions yeah the hoss, do they, will they grow here or are they not? good question there, there's a there's a florida hoss that i think does better with the humidity that we have so some some things that can grow in california though we might have the same chill hours and we might have the same kind of weather they're so much drier there and we're so much more humid that we battle things that, that they don't have to battle with. So even with palm trees, something will grow there but won't grow here because of the humidity and the hot nights that we have. So, um, but I know there's a Florida Haas, you know, and I've had people grow Haas and they've had success with it so far, you know, so we'll have to see. Any other avocado questions? Yeah. Well, that, there's another good question. Like I've, I've had avocados before and, and what makes a good avocado for me even if I just get out of the store, is the oil content. There are some avocados that you find in the stores. They're called a slim cotto. Uh, it's just gross. It's like, it's like watercolors compared to oil paints. You know, like it's just, it's just thin and tasteless. I like a good oily avocado. The winter Mexicans, the Haas varieties, the Florida Haas, um, Choquette, Lula, uh, Monroe, all seem to have a good oil content. They have the more leathery some are smooth, they, they vary, they vary. Yeah, yeah, well, I see, I know what you're saying. So the Haas typically has that bumpy, I think that that does, isn't really an indicator of whether it's oily or not, because the Brogdon has this shiny purple skin and it's very oily. So I don't think that's an indicator, but there are some Florida varieties that are more, um, more oil content and some that are less, so. Yeah, she asked about transplanting, well, just fruit trees in general, you can transplant them. Um, but what I'd recommend doing with that, when you transplant a tree, say you wanted to take it and you're moving, and you're like, I don't want to leave this tree here. Um, you want to root prune it a couple months before you actually move. In other words, you take a shovel and you go around the outside edge uh, th that's manageable of that root ball and root prune it so it can stay in the ground, but you've already kind of created that cut root system. It develops finer roots that are within that root ball. And then when the time comes, yeah, you can typically move it. It may be, have a rough start. You may have to prune off some of the canopy of it, uh, but it can be moved, yeah. So some of these fruit trees are pretty tough. They're pretty, they're used to tropical environments. So avocado, so you wanna find, she said, how do you plant it high and dry? Well, you wanna plant it high and dry when you plant it, meaning, meaning you don't wanna set it too, down too low. You know, you want the crown of the, the, crown of the tree. In other words, uh, well, the, the tree, where, where the tree comes down and begins to swell out, that's the crown of the tree before it hits the roots. You want that to be above your soil line because you can always add a little more to there, but you don't want it too low. But when you're looking for a place, like I would not plant in the rainy season, I wouldn't plant my, my avocado here. I would plant it up there on, where as it slopes up because I know it's gonna drain better there. So you just have to find a place in your yard that typically when you get a lot of rains, you know, say we get three or four inches of rain one day, uh, look in your yard, see where the spots are. That's where you don't want to plant it. You want it to be up near your house, well, not too close to the house, but you know, up where it's going to drain. The, the highest spot in the yard is where I put a mango, or uh, sorry, avocado, yeah. Couldn't you treat a mound? I've done that. I've gone over here to a place called Mr. Mulch, because my backyard was a part of a cow pasture and it kind of sloped down. So I went to Mr. Mulch, brought in a, a truckload or two of, of dirt and created some large mounded areas and that's worked very well to keep that basic your basic root system up out of the ground so there are things you can do yeah absolutely so all right let me move to, to the next most common one of the common what was i going to do let's go avocado mango oh um carambola everybody know what carambola is star fruit star fruit is a wonderful tree to grow the star fruit back in the day used to be very um sour and tart and all you could really do with it is Dump. I mean, I remember growing, I, I used to climb trees like this of, of star fruit and get them all and then, but you'd have to put sugar on them because they were so tart. Nowadays, in fact, I just, I just pulled, the, where is it? Oh uh, yeah, this one here, fantastic varieties. They're sweet, but they have a little bit of tartness to them. They're crunchy, they're not mushy. Um, they're, they're, and then they have a little bit of that rose floral overtone, some fantastic fruits very high in vitamins and vitamin C, vitamin A, um, and carambola is a great, you can plant it in shade. Um, they, they produce in shade. Um, 
Uh, they don't really like wet feet, but they're not as picky as an avocado. Um, but they produce a, 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 sh a fruit that's, you know, it's about this big. And then when you cut it, the reason it's called star fruit is when you slice it and make it, cut them into slices like this, it looks like a star. It's, they're, they have ribs to them. And it's a great fruit. They're very prolific. They, they fruit like crazy um, several times a year. Um, you know, my, you can make up, my wife makes up a, a, a star fruit upside down cake. You can slice them up, put them in salads. You can make juices out of them. But it's a really good all around, one of the most common popular tropical fruits. And they grow very well here. Um, they, they can be a little sensitive to cold, just like any other, any other uh, of the tropical fruits. But it's a wonderful tree to try. And some of the varieties that they have now are pretty much what you're going to get is, you know, a carry is going to be, I think it's K-A-R-I, is a little more tart. But the rest of the varieties are very, are very sweet, sweet, uh, good varieties. So anyway, I'd recommend that. Yeah. Not that I know of. She asked if they have dwarf varieties, uh, but again, with any fruit tree, I keep mine. Um, uh, I used to I used to be a part of the local rare fruit council until the they kind of dissolved about five or six years ago, and the guy that ran that he said he he likes to make them an umbrella tree, and so what he does is in fact that's what mine look like. I have a nice trunk that comes up, and since I've been I'm kind of into bonsai as well, I like to shape and create my trunks. I'm going to talk about that too, but I have a nice tree that comes up. It branches about here and then it branches again. And then at the top, it's pretty much kind of capped out at like 12 feet. And then it produces this gorgeous umbrella and I can just walk around like this picking my fruit. You know what I mean? Uh, so that's, you, you keep it, you manage it to that level, and you know? And it will absolutely. Yes, it will. Yeah, and absolutely. Uh, well, um, a star fruit tree will want to get probably 30, 40 feet tall. But again, you don't have to let it do that. You can, you know, just with, I, I got some, I have a variety of like those extending little, you squeeze it here and it pinches here. You can cut things off. Or I have some that extend out and you just pull the lever and it cuts larger branches. And I just, you know, at the end of the summer, I go around and just knock everything down a bit and that's it, you know, unless we get a freeze and that takes it down, you know. So, so star fruit is a wonderful, it's a beautiful tree, has these gorgeous leaves that will turn yellow and drop off at a certain time of year. Everybody panics and that's normal. It just recycles out and sheds, you know, but yeah, that's normal. Sometimes they'll curl up and get weird and some, yeah, that's all normal. They don't, not all the star fruits are going to look perfect, but they all taste really good, you know. Another, one other thing with the star fruit is typically when you eat it, if you have any form of uh, any slight kidney issues, there are, a, there's a little bit of, of oxalate or oxalic uh, crystals in a star fruit when they're not quite ripe. But even so, I like to take my star fruit when I slice them. But before, well, before I slice them, I'll take and I'll, I'll just slice off about an eighth of an inch of the ribs, of the very outside edge of the ribs, because that's where the, the oxalates are found. And then I slice it up and it's fine. So I, I've never had an issue, but I've read that before. So just a word of warning on that. So. It takes the oxalates out. The oxalic acid? What do the oxalates do? Oh, what are the oxalates? They're, they're not good for your kidneys. Yeah, I guess they maybe they would give you kidney stones. Yeah. <laughs> Typically, they're grafted again, so you want to wait a couple years before you let them produce. Sometimes you can let a couple of them produce. Um, uh, how fast do they grow? Is that what you said? Yeah. Pretty quickly, in my experience. Uh, I think it depends. I've seen people that stick them kind of out in the middle of their yard in a field, and the sun kind of beats on them, and they don't get quite enough water. I found them personally to grow better like I would, I would put them right here under this canopy, near a shade tree, underneath a shade tree, or close by another tree. They seem to grow fine, you know. How wide do they get? Well, I mean, how wide do you, well, if you, if you just let them go, they'd probably get 30 feet by 40 feet. But typically, it's more like, you know, 12, 15 feet by maybe 12, 15 feet. So, nope, they'll produce fine on their own. Uh, so then the varieties I'd recommend, this is what I have in my yard. It's called a Sri. SRI, like Sri Lanka, Sri, and then Kembagon. It's K E K E M B A N G A N. You kind of write down something close, you'll find it on the internet, you know? Just Sri Kembagon, you know? That's a great variety. Um, another really good variety is Bell. It's a fantastic variety. B E L L is a great variety. Yeah. She asked if you could grow them in a big pot. The answer is yes. Um, some of the, they, some of them, even the mangoes, the smaller cultivars of mangoes, w if kept well and kept watered properly, will grow in pots. They call them condo mangoes for people that live in a condo and have a mango tree. Starfruit will do the same thing. You just have to really be on it and make sure you're, 
it's getting fertilizer and those types of things. A little harder to manage, but it, it, it would work in a, in a pot, yes, yeah. You know, a lot of things that happen with tropical fruit trees, you know, they'll, they'll get weird spots like my mangoes. I have one I just put in called the Spirit of 76. It's one of Gary Zill's new variety. And the whole, the whole like one side, it all got this black sooty mold, you know. It's not gonna do anything, I'm not worried about it. I didn't even treat it and it's fine now because the sun started, because the sun, you know, started moving this way and then it got all fine. So a lot of these things can be self-managed. They do say that some of the things like mangoes would benefit from a copper fungicide if we get a really rainy season so that the blooms will set. So there are a few things you can do, but those are questions and things I can answer individually. So, so mango, avocado, starfruit, great trees to grow. Let me give you a couple of trees that are uncommon, that people don't, you don't really hear about, but that are fantastic to grow. The first one is called a sapodilla. Sapodilla, okay? And it's a tree that can, yeah, it's a, those who know it, know it. It's a tree that, okay, let me describe the fruit to you, and then you'll be like, huh, what? So the fruit is about the size of a large chicken egg. It's got a kind of a scurfy brown outside skin. But when you cut it open, it has the texture of a fine pear, but it tastes like that pear has been soaked in brown sugar and cinnamon. Yeah, it's a dessert fruit. It's fantastic. The, the, the sapodilla trees are drought tolerant. They're flood tolerant. They're hurricane tolerant. It's a beautiful tree. A variety I would recommend would be an Alano, A-L-A-N-O. Alano is a great variety. Um, uh, there's many varieties. I can't think of them offhand. It's not to keep. Do you remember what variety do you have? I can't remember. Yeah, there's some really fantastic. I have an Alano sapodilla, and it's the most consistent producer of fruit that I have in my yard. It's always fruiting. There's always fruit on it. They taste wonderful. Squirrels like to get to them, but it's a great tree. It's a beautiful tree. Um, it's state. You can keep it compact, uh, but a sapodilla is a wonderful fruit. I don't know if, how many people of you have access to the internet, but when you, when you, if you want to just Google it, Look at the pictures of the tree. It's a wonderful fruit. It's one of those things that you can place in your yard. It looks gorgeous, it produces, and it's a wonderful tasting fruit. That's a good one to have, a sapodilla. Most people don't, all time of year. There's always fruit on it, always, yeah. For, in my experience, of course, I have a, a tree that's been in the ground 15 years, you know. So it's a really good, really good one. Here's another one for you. It's called a strawberry tree. Yeah, do you have two of them? Love it. They're so good. It's called a strawberry tree. The, uh, the, the, the Latin name is Montingia calbura. Don't worry about that. But the reason it's called a strawberry tree is that it, the blooms, the blooms look like strawberry blooms. The fruit has nothing to do with strawberries. But the fruit are little small, little red cherries. I call them cherries. They're little globular fruit that tastes like cotton candy. They have like a 97% sugar content and they're addicting and you can freeze them, you can, I mean, birds love them. It's a good distraction fruit to have in your yard. Um, but it's, 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 a, it's a, they call, I also call it a Jamaican cherry, um, but it's a wonderful fruit. I don't know if they have any out there, but they do carry them. Yeah. Do you think it's a Barbados? No, no, good question. Yeah, it's different, it's not a Barbados cherry. It's called a Jamaican cherry or strawberry tree fruit. And it's, um, it, it grows up to be this beautiful, natural umbrella tree, real soft leaves. It is short lived. It lives about maybe 10, 15 years, you know, you know, but judging the crowd, I mean, you know, so. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. I'm totally joking. So, um, but that's it. That's a really good one. Not many people know about it, but it's like, it's like a mulberry. It's like the, 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 the southern version of a mulberry. You walk around and you can constantly find them on the ground. You pick them out of the tree. They're always bearing. They're always red and they taste wonderful. Kids love them. They're great for grandkids. Um, and again, it'll distract birds. It'll distract the squirrels, the rats. Um, and it's just a wonderful, beautiful tree to grow. So uh, a couple of unique ones. Sapodilla, look into that one. Uh, strawberry tree, look into that one. That's a great tree. Um, uh, I was going to do canistel, but I think I'm going to touch on lychee. Has anybody ever heard of a lychee or lychee? Yeah. Lychee. lychee. Yeah. Lychee. So depending on, I, I asked, I asked someone that was from uh, uh, the eastern region of China, and they said, depending on if you, it's like if you're from New York or from Florida, what you say, you know. So it's lychee, 
in one region, lychee in the other region. So I call them lychees, I don't know. But anyway, uh, that is a wonderful tree to grow in a subtropical region which we're in. Now, it will freeze if we get like a hard freeze, but it produces, a lychee is a, um, it's a red fruit about the size of a silver dollar. It has a hard, crusty outer shell. You kind of crack it open, and inside is a very, it's like, it's, it's like a muscadine grape or a grape. It's kind of a, a grape texture, but it tastes like, uh, it's, it's sweet, but it's a little bit tart, but it has a really strong uh, floral or rose overtone to it. And they're very common, uh, and, and obviously from Asia, and they're a fantastic tree. They make a gorgeous tree. They can be huge, but I keep mine very, very small, but they seem to do very, very well here. So a lychee or lychee, probably any variety you get is gonna be wonderful. Um, there's Brewster, uh, Mauritius, there's many varieties. I may or may not have uh, listed them on that, my page there, but, but a lychee, I think, but I think the best thing to do is, is try it first. Find a place that has one. We do that and we take them all frozen to the Keys and have them out in the boat. It's wonderful, yeah, yeah. What she's saying is, guys, a couple of these tropical fruit trees, like mango, sometimes you get an overabundance of them, like you get a lot of them. Mangoes freeze very well. You, I mean, you, sometimes people freeze the whole mango, but I'll take, if we have a lot of mango, I'll just slice them up, take a whole day to slice all the mango up into little cubes and put them in the freezer you can eat them up to a year or two later. They're wonderful. So know that you can freeze mango. She was just recommending to freeze lychees, which is fantastic. It's a great idea. Um, I've never tried to freeze star fruit, but based on the structure, they're almost like a pineapple as far as the fibers and cell structure. I don't think they would freeze well, uh, but papaya you can freeze. Um, so uh, um, definitely uh, lychees are wonderful. It's, it's something you need to try, but I would say try it first. That's what I was trying to say when the train come. Try it. Sometimes even Walmart carries lychees during the summertime. And they typically only bloom once a year, uh, or flower or fruit. Usually the first couple weeks of June is when they're gonna, it's when you're gonna get lychees here. Um, and so, but they're, you know, they're on my trees right now, little tiny ones, you know, and they're fantastic. But obviously you wanna try it before you actually buy it, you know what I mean? So that you know what you're getting into. Um, let me talk to you a little bit about pruning. I know a lot of people are planting new things they have established things, but I want to show you kind of my philosophy behind uh, when you put a tree in the ground and, and why you should prune it this way, okay? So here's what I do when I get a tree. So I'm going to say, say today I'm going to take, um, take that mango home there. Of course, it's already started going, but sometimes you'll get a mango tree uh, and, and you basically have this long skinny thing here and then you may have one or two Things going up like this. So here's kind of how, how it branches out. If it hasn't started branching by, by say, this big, this tall, maybe three feet tall, and I've got many trees before that they, they haven't done that, I'll just literally cut it right there. Just slice, like, just slice it right off, right? So what happens is when you cut that tree, you're determining where, you're, where that tree is gonna begin its structure, you know? And I like to have a compact tree that, that has multiple tips and does this is how, so this is the way to do this, right? So when you cut it, wherever you decide to let it begin uh, branching, you're gonna get several little shoots that are gonna come out, five or six shoots like this. So you let five or six of them begin to develop and they'll go out and they'll produce like this, make a nice little structure here, right? So they're gonna, th there's your main structure and that, that'll start wherever you make your first cut in, in, a, in a mango tree, maybe an avocado tree, uh, other trees are different, but I'm specifically talking about mangoes because everybody's like, how do I prune it? What do I do? How do I keep a small tree? This is how you do it. It starts early. And I learned all this from, from Richard Campbell down in Miami 20 years ago. So at that point, it's going to start growing these, these limbs here, right? So we've got four, four structural limbs. If it hasn't started branching out again, because typically it'll start branching out. If it hasn't started uh, by 18 or 20 inches, I'll cut it again. And then it'll automatically put out three or four more shoots like this, right? So what, what's happening is, because where, where, do, where do you get the fruit from a mango tree? Where does the fruit come from? Yeah, the very At the very tips, right? Yeah. So I've seen a lot of people with these, I'll go look around, people planting trees, and they have this you know, pretty thick mango tree that comes up, 
and there's one, two, maybe three branches, and then it goes like really long, and then maybe one or two, and then they've got maybe eight or nine mangoes on this tree that should have 20 mangoes on it, right? So it's all about the pruning. You want more tips because the, where the tips are is where the fruit's going to be, right? So once and so these things come out, you let them go about 18 or 20 inches, and you cut them again if they haven't already started. Some will naturally start to do their own. Um, and this is from 20 years of experience. Of I, I've guided my trees from the get, from the well. It got set back in 2010 with that hard freeze. I cut some some of the stuff back to the ground nearly above the graft, but then I redirected. And so now I have all these trees that have these beautiful dense canopies that are smaller with, and they flower like mad because there's a lot of tips, right? Does that make sense? So, and even if you have a tree that's already pretty big, if you were to simply take that tree and, and just kind of cut it, it'll, it'll produce new growth that comes out. And then that growth, you can let it go, develop, and then cut it again. So you can kind of redirect a tree that's already even established like that. So now, a lot of people say, well, then you're gonna, you know, then it becomes too, um, you need airflow in this that I agree. You do, you do want a tree to be open a bit because if you get too congested of a tree, too dense of a canopy, then airflow will minimize uh, and you'll get sooty, sooty mold and fruit rot. But there's ways to open that back up by just removing the stuff that grows inward, just like on a bonsai tree, remove the stuff that's growing in and then you can open up that central canopy. But, but what you've done is from the early, early on, you've established this gorgeous, small, compact tree that's got a nice branching structure and you can direct that so um, and then again I talked about when it's done yeah good well I wouldn't because yeah no good question I'm not gonna try to lift that um, this this tree is exactly where I would have probably cut it I'm gonna lift it up so what you're seeing here is about the size um, well interesting too what it's done is it's naturally a branched out here on what's called a terminal node, okay? So if I were to cut the tree right right here, it would it would do the exact same things it's doing here because there's a, it's called a, a terminal node. It's almost like a, a bump in it where, where everything produces out. Now, if you don't cut it on a terminal node, it won't come out as evenly, but you might get three or four that come out. So if you cut it, try to cut it right above that, it's called a terminal node. And you cut it there and it produces out very even, you know, things. Um, but that one's already started branching, so I would just put that in the ground and leave it. That's a good one, you know. But if it hasn't started branching, if it hadn't, I would have cut it right there, basically. And that's kind of where, where you get it going. Yeah, she asked about pulling the leaves off. It's interesting because we do that with bonsai, but what that does is promotes new leaf growth. So what I would typically do is it's called tip pruning. Even if you're not wanting to take, you know, giant chunks out, after it's fruited, uh, to, to open the canopy up a little bit, instead of just pulling leaves, I would just, anything that's growing inward, you want to cut, and then I would also tip it back, it's called. So, so uh, you can, if you have a branch that's maybe, you know, long, you can kind of come in maybe a foot or two, look for that terminal node, it kind of, it's like a swollen area in the branch, cut it right there, and it'll reshoot out several things, several, several, you know, but you can bring that down by doing that. No, you just cut it. You cut it perpendicularly, just just above it. Okay. Yeah, just above it. Yeah. She asked if you cut something back, will it fruit the next year? Funny, I, I did prune back one of my mango trees, and what I didn't prune, fruited, and what obviously what I pruned did not fruit. But that's okay though, you know. So it, it'll come back the next year, you know. And some of these trees are alternate bearing, you know, like lychees and things. Um, but let me talk a little bit about what to do when you get it in the ground. Um, Obviously, when you plant it, you want to plant your, your tropical fruit tree a little higher. So the crown, again, the crown of the tree is where the, the actual tree swells at the very bottom and then comes out a bit and then turns in the root system. That needs to be not above the ground, but not below the soil level. You want it up a little bit because you can always add more dirt in later. Then um, I like to you make sure you have a, a cleanly cultivated area so you don't have any grasses or weeds competing with that the root structure of your tree. And what I typically do, I like these pine fines. Mulch, it's a mulch product just from the bark of pine trees, which is eco-friendly. Uh, but what I like about it is it's, in many areas, there were pine trees all throughout this area. And so it's kind of a natural uh, thing. It's got a good acidity to it. I like putting that down as a mulch. Some people like to put cypress down. I wouldn't recommend the, the stained colored stuff um, for around fruit trees. I typically like something a little more natural. And this seems to break down well. 
uh, and I found that if I, I pull my pull this back under a tree, I can see earthworms coming up and pulling that down and kind of creating this nice organic rich area. And so uh, mulch does a couple things. It moderates the temperature because we're going to get into some hot, you know, hot weather coming up. It moderates the soil temperature. It um, once we get a good solid rain, it keeps that keeps that that water in there because the heat with the dry period. It also kind of amends the soil a bit. Like down here, when people put a tree in, I know uh, perhaps up north, I'm not familiar because I've lived here my whole life, but down here we just have beach sand basically. There's not real good soil. So a lot of people say, should I amend the soil with something uh, when I plant a fruit tree? My answer is no, because when you amend the soil and put like stuff in with it, what happens is the roots get real happy and content right there in that spot. And they don't have to reach out and try to find nutrition and move out. I just, when I, I, I make the, the, the hole big enough, I put my thing in, I don't put anything else in, I backfill it with water and soil, and then just let it do a thing. Because when you put in you know, potting soil and, or, or something rich right there in that thing, it just stays and thinks it's in a pot still and has no reason for those roots to go out and reach and to find things. And so that's kind of my method of planting. And then mulch it pretty heavily, maybe four to six inches of mulch on the top area. That keeps, it keeps the competition out. The, the, uh, but you wanna make sure it's back from the crown of the tree. So the tree comes down, don't have any mulch right up against it. You want it to be a dry area, probably a circle of maybe eight to 10 inches away from the crown of the tree. And then out where the, where the drip line's gonna be. Yeah. Um, Mm, I guess, I don't know. I've done it with my gardens. She asked if you can mulch with newspaper. Um, I think it'll break down. I've done cardboard when I put, put it down below a garden. Um, it keeps the weeds down, but if for nothing more than keeping the weeds down, because it does, it does break down. So, I mean, I suppose you could. Yeah, I think so. Uh, probably less with cardboard, more with newspaper if it's shredded though. So, I, I don't know, I think, you know, I mean, the water will permeate, but probably not as good as mulch. So, yeah, so I, I really prefer mulch. Um, yeah. I may have missed it. Yeah. Thickness yeah. Of the mulch? Good question. The thickness of the mulch, um, anywhere between three to six inches, I would say. You know, a pretty good amount. Um, but, but, you know, this time we're really dry right now. And I, I was walking out and saw some of my fruit trees, and I wanted to make sure that they had plenty of water. And I, I watered a sprinkler for a little while just because we've been dry. And it it's, takes a couple hours to get through that to permeate once. But once the rains start and that water begins, see water moves sideways in Florida. It comes down and goes this way and this way. So once you get it in, uh, once we get a couple of good solid rains, I think that'll help out. But in the meantime, you might you, a lot of people say, my mangoes are dropping right now. What's going on? Well, the tree is only going to hold what it can bear based on the weather, you know. And so we're super dry right now. And so I think a, a little bit of at this point, now that the mangoes are on there and they're set, there's no more flowering, might be a good time to make sure it's water. Don't, don't, mangoes don't like drastic changes, but, they, it's, but you can get some water on there to begin because I think we're supposed to get rain tomorrow and it's going to start happening. But if we continue not to get rain, now would be the time to, to get some water on the fruit trees so they don't continue to drop. But they just they kind of know what they're going to do. Yeah, he asked about fertilizing and pH levels because you could have an area up by your house where the fill is different dirt than it is on the outside of your property. And if, you, if your pH level is, is off in one area of your property, you'll notice trees not, so I, have, I, have a, I have a carry tree in, on the front property, carry tree in the back property. The back one has always been deficient. It's just, try, it's bar, it barely is alive. But the one up by my house is fantastic. It's all about pH, it has nothing to do with, but pH, if the pH isn't right for the tree, uh, then no matter how much fertilizer you put down, there's no uptake because the pH is wrong. So I would really recommend if you're going to plant something somewhere or you're having trouble with something, take a little sample. I think our local extension office will do a, a test. Maybe it's $5 or something. They'll test your pH and you'll know whether you need to amend that with lime to change the pH of your soil. And then because if your pH isn't right, no matter how much fertilizer you put down, there will never be uptake. And that's a whole other conversation, you know. But yeah. Yeah, I've, I've just recently put in some trees, some palms and things, and I'm really watering heavily. Now, see, a lot of people, uh, the, whole, the whole lawn thing as well, it's better to put down, like when I go for my, I don't have spr really a sprinkler system I, I run, but if I'm going to water my lawn and I can see my grass drying out in the front because I'm in an HOA, so my front has to look nice, my back's a jungle. Um, but but I, instead of like like trying to do like 10 minutes a day zone-wise, you're, you're not getting 
the depth. What you want to do with grasses, I don't know why I'm talking about grass, but, but to answer your question, you want a deep soaking, but, le but less frequently, especially with lawns down here. So I'll, I'll soak for, put a tuna can out. You want to put down about two inches of water, or I'm sorry, uh, at least, I'm sorry, two hours is about one inch. So you want to put down at least an inch, maybe two inches of, rain, of water when you're watering things in. So instead of sprinkling your new mango tree or whatever tree, just a little bit each day, give it a good soak and let that, that should hold it for a couple of days at least. And get your finger down there, feel the soil, but it's better to do a longer soaking period of watering with lawns, with trees, than it is to kind of mist it. Because when you're doing a little bit each day, you might just be wetting the top of the mulch. That's it. So yeah, to answer your question, get a good soaking in, more, less frequently than more frequently. And that's better with lawns too, because with the lawns, it's for anybody that's moved down here recently, the St. Augustine grasses, even Bahia grasses, if you water sh sh a little bit each day, just like that tree that you've amended the soil with, you develop shallow roots. And shallow roots uh, lead to unhealthy grass, unhealthy, you get cinch bugs, all those things that come in. But, but w f less frequent deep watering, uh, produces roots that have to f try to find, you know, tr to try to find this, the thing, you get longer root systems. Anyway, I'm, I digress, sorry. <laughs> she asked about sand, it just drains so quickly, almost too quickly. But what I, what I would say is, um, that's why we use the mulch. Because once you get a good deep watering in, that mulch helps, the, helps it from, you know, and it stays down there longer than you think though. But you know, when you get a lot of earthworms, they get a lot of things going, um, you know, it, it, it begins to make the soil more organic, you know. A lot of people put compost down too, yes. Um, I've seen people do it before. It's a little harder. She asked if you can put lychees in a pot. I think any tropical fruit trees you can. It just has to be a big enough pot and it has to be um, really very well maintained, you know. But it's, yeah, people do it. I've seen them at Epcot, so, <laughs> you know. So yeah, it happens, so. Yes, let me talk about bananas. I'll take a couple minutes on that. Bananas are, they're like toddlers. You have to feed them all the time. They're, they're, they're I mean, they're, bananas, Bananas can take, I mean, fertilizing every week, practically. Bananas, I've seen them grow in a sandy soil, but I've seen them thrive in more of a mucky soil. My father-in-law has, has them on a, a slope where it's kind of mucky, and he just, he's got bananas every single week, you know. I put mine on my sandy soil, my cow pasture, and I've got to feed them so heavily, you know. But they, the, bananas require a lot of, and there's some great varieties, but they require a lot of compost, leaf matter, mulch, and every bit of fertilizer, you get eggshells, whatever you have, if you're composting, if you're not, they can take so much fertilizer, it's not even funny, but they're heavy feeders and they need a lot of food. Is anybody growing jackfruit? Has anybody heard of jackfruit? Yeah. Jackfruit is a wonderful fruit. I, 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 I want to just hit on a couple things, but it, that's another one of my uncommon fruits that do grow well here. There's a huge one. If you walk, as you walk out to this back parking lot, it's growing right inside the corner of the fence. There's a big one growing back there. So on a jackfruit, like a papaya, you'll get a male flower and a female flower. The, 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 the male flower looks just like it's gonna be a jackfruit, but then it withers up and dies. The female flower, which is somewhere near there, is the one that's gonna take. And I've seen that on mine as well. It, yeah, it will. Give it, how, how long have you had it in the ground? Oh, five, six years, maybe. Yeah, sometimes jackfruits take a little longer to get started up. You'll get the flowering, even on fruits in general, and then everything falls off. It's frustrating, but give it time.